Hi, how's it going? My name is The Merg. Welcome to the channel. Today we're going to talk about five characteristics of life and three of the most well-known theories in biology. This is my very first video in the series and if you like what you see please click the subscribe button and the like button. You can also share it with all your friends as well if you think this might help them. Without further ado, let's get started. So you can ask yourself a couple weird questions like what is life and what does it mean to be alive? There are a lot of ways to actually describe living organisms and there's been actually a lot of debate between scientists on how exactly to describe what being alive means. However, scientists have grudgingly agreed that living organisms all share five similar traits. These five key features are what it takes at a minimum to be considered alive. The organism must have cells or at least one cell, particularly membrane-bound cells that regulate what goes in and out and protects it from the environment. The organism must also be able to replicate. We're talking about reproduction, creating offsprings, and even cloning oneself. For example, one bacterium splitting into two bacteria. Evolution is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms, from earlier ancestors. When we talk about information, we're referring to organisms genes, not those genes, that contain information about its genetics and hereditary features. Information may also come from our environment, but to a lesser extent. Even now, our cells in our bodies are using this information to build things in our bodies to keep us alive. To maintain life and all that we mentioned so far, life needs energy. Different organisms require and acquire energy in different ways. For example, how you would see plants absorb sunlight and how animals eat food. These five traits basically set the foundation for three of the most famous theories in all of biological science. The first one being the cell theory, the second is the theory of evolution, and finally the chromosome theory of inheritance. Now before we talk about the theories, let's go ahead and talk about the people involved in those discoveries. Robert Hooke was an Englishman who created an early version of a microscope. Now it didn't look like anything you've probably ever seen before, but the microscope was able to magnify objects up to 30 times its normal size. Probably the most notable was how he used his invention to examine tree bark, or what you would call a cork. He discovered that the cork was made up of boxy room-like structures, which he called those individual compartments cells. Later on in history, we have a man named Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who decided to improve upon the microscope developed by Robert Hooke. He built a microscope that was capable of magnifying an object up to 300 times its normal size. Van Leeuwenhoek's most notable discovery was when he found out that there were tons of organisms living inside pond water. He called these organisms animal kills, but it never really caught on. Alright, awesome. Let's get started with the first theory on the list. Where do cells come from? The cell theory tries to answer this by stating that all organisms are made up of cells and all cells come from pre-existing cells. This explanation makes sense, but it didn't catch on because it didn't explain how the very first cell came into existence, something we'll have to talk about later on in the series. Other scientists questioned the theory recollecting how maggots and worms seemingly and spontaneously rose from dead animals. To study this theory, a scientist named Louis Pasteur built an experiment involving two nutrient environments, one with easy access for potential bacteria in the air, and the other one had a particle barrier that would still allow air to pass through except for any particles to get in. In conclusion, he found that colonies had grown only on the environment that had easy access for particles and potential bacteria to flow into. What did this mean? Well, it didn't necessarily cancel out spontaneous generation, but it did however convince the world that cells do come from other cells. Let's move on to evolution, and I know you guys have been asking yourself this all the time, what is evolution? What the books will tell you is that evolution is defined as the characteristic changes in a population. So what is a population? Well, in evolution, a population is a group of the same species. So now you can say that evolution is the characteristic changes in a group of the same species. 
species. A scientist famous for the earliest studies of known evolution was Charles Darwin. He theorized that species are related by common ancestry and that they can be modified from generation to generation. He also helped to explain the idea of natural selection. Darwin realized that there are these unique traits between individuals of the same population, groups of the same species. Take for example the beak sizes and shapes of a species of bird. These differences are oftentimes inheritable, meaning that they can be passed from one offspring to another. Given a particular environment, certain differences can actually be advantageous to the offspring, allowing it to better survive and reproduce. This is termed natural selection because it focuses on the individual. What natural selection does is that it leads to the evolution of a population. Biologists have documented and witnessed some other phenomena being a part of natural selection, and it causes one species to branch out into a second different species. It's called speciation. So there's a couple key words you should know. One is fitness, which means how well are you able to reproduce offspring? And the second is adaptation. This is the trait you have in your possession that improves your chances of fitness. Just think of fitness as a gauge on how many babies you can make and adaptation as a tool that you use to increase that gauge. Well, so far so good. We've covered the cell theory and the theory of evolution. Just remember that the cell is the fundamental structural unit of all living organisms, and that all species are related by something called common ancestry. The reason why we're all different today is due to natural selection leading to evolution. And finally, the last and final key to the puzzle is something we call the chromosome theory of inheritance. To sum it all up, when scientists were able to discover chromosomes, it led to the discovery that within every chromosome there was a group of genes, and that in every gene was a group of DNA. DNA is the hereditary material that all living organisms carry. Another potentially bigger discovery in our history was how we describe the structure of DNA. A scientist known as Francis Crick proposed that DNA was a double-stranded helix. Within the helix, there were four different kinds of building blocks. Each single strand of the helix consists of a group of building blocks connected together in linear fashion. Scientists labeled each of the four blocks as either A, T, C, or G. With any particular combination and length of these blocks, it creates a code or information a living organism or creature needs to live. Remember when we said double-stranded? Well, both strands follow similar linear designs, but in different sequences. What keeps them connected is the attraction between certain letters. You should know that in DNA strands, A on one strand always pairs with T on the other, and C always pairs with G. Scientists were now able to describe the flow of information from how DNA codes for RNA and how RNA codes for proteins. They called this the central dogma. We'll get into RNA later in the series, but for now, RNA is the framework for making proteins, and proteins carry out important tasks to keep you alive. Well, that's it for now. Regarding the cell theory, how do you think the first cells came about? I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. We might get a better understanding of that at some point in the series. I would love to hear some feedback from you about the channel. And again, if you like the channel, press the like button, smash the subscribe button, and share it with your fellow classmates.